it's uh, five o'clock and it looks like we have a quorum. So I'd like to call the Bloomington Historic, Commu uh, Historic Preservation Commission to order for June 11th, 2020. Okay. Ready, roll. Okay. Doug Bruce. Sam DeSaller. Susan Dyer. Jeff Golden. Yes. Deb Hutton. Lee Sandweiss. Here. John Saunders. Here. Chris Sturbaum. Duncan Campbell. Ernesto Castaneda. Derek Ritchie. Jenny Southern. I'm not sure we have I only heard three yeses, Jeff, Sorry, Lee, and I, John. I just admitted Sam and Susan and some other iPad. Okay, so Sam is here. Okay. Hold and on. Susan. They're joining. Let's, let's let them join and then. Okay, I see Susan. Sam's in. Yeah, I see, I see Sam. Okay, I've got him. Is that quorum? Uh, you, you do have quorum now. Okay, you're good. Great. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, I had a little trouble getting in. Oh, I'm sorry, Susan. Oh, no, it wasn't you. Oh. It just wouldn't open. <laughs> oh, Lord, Lord. All right. Um, so let's uh, do removal of first. Uh, oh, actually, one thing we need to do first. Um, when we make a motion, uh, the commissioner is doing that motion. Please uh, give your name first. That way, when Eddie does the uh, roll call and stuff, you'll be able to line your hand up for us. Perfect. All right, so uh, we need approval of the minutes from our last meeting. We don't have any. This is Jeff, so moved. Uh, we don't have any, Jeff. So we're good. Thank you. All right, let's move on to our COA commission review, which is a continuation uh, from our last meeting, 325 South Roger Street. Petitioner is Josh Kelly. Josh, are you here? Yes, I am here. Thank Good you for having me. Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure you were present. All right. Um, so as John mentioned, this is a continuation from the May 28th meeting. Um, the HPC asked the petitioner to come back and readjust his proposal uh, to incorporate some of the comments and feedback from the May 28th meeting and uh, the petitioner has done so. So I'm gonna uh, go over the, the changes uh, just to remind everybody, this is a, a fence, a petition for a fence um, in the Prospect Hill Historic District. So what we have here is uh, what you see is in a yellow dash is going to be a wrought iron fence, uh, four feet in height. And then what you see in an orange uh, dash will be eight foot wood vertical board picket fence. Um, so that so we've changed from a wood picket fence four feet to a wrought iron four feet fence, and we've changed from a horizontal orientation eight foot privacy fence to a vertical orientation uh, eight foot privacy fence. So staff finds that the fence materials, uh, which is wrought iron and wood, and the fence heights, which is four feet in the front and eight feet in the back, respectively, meet the guidelines uh, in the district and the standards. Um, now the guidelines do state that in general, uh, a new fence should start no farther forward than a point midway between the front and rear facades of the house. Um, we do see here that the uh, front the fence does start forward of that midpoint here. Um, it does start behind the front building wall, which I think is an important distinction. Um, so it's really a side yard fence that they're creating here, not a front yard fence. Um, and and the, uh, the fence is wrought iron, it's see-through, it's transparent. The height and style, um, you know, make it uh, fit in and, and not obscure any historic character materials. 
Um, so for those reasons, uh, staff would recommend approval of COA 20-20. Um, Josh, do you have any additional stuff for us? Um, I don't think there's anything to add. That that covers most of it. I think as we went back to um, take another approach at this, we wanted to try to come and find a material um, that was going to be consistent with um, what we thought would fit better in the neighborhood and, and looking around at some of the other places in the neighborhood. I think it was 516 West 3rd Street. Um, which is in the Prospect Hill District, had a uh, wrought iron fence in the front yard, um, which looked like a um, very nice design. Uh, I think, though, that as for feedback from the last meeting, um, we definitely didn't want to create the you know front yard kind of fenced off component. The, the main thing here is to keep aesthetic value, historical character, and provide um, an ability to kind of safely enjoy the yard space. Um, so also, um, we'll be trying to find um, kind of antique material. I looked online on the Etsy website and was able to find a four foot high wrought iron antique style fence um, that I can order in sections. Um, I've got a contractor that can install that fence. So we'll make sure that it um, isn't a modern looking wrought iron fence, which I don't think we would like. And certainly um, I know the um, probably wouldn't be consistent with what the commission is looking for. So I think um, with that style and, and having it set back behind the front porch um, there on that um, west side, that allows porch access. Um, and then over on the prospect side, uh, that allows us to be able to enter the house. As you can see there, there's only two entrances and both of those are on the south prospect side. So that's why it would be very difficult to have um, the fence set back farther from prospect. Um, so I think we tried to cover that. If there's anything else, any other questions, happy to answer them. Um, we're hoping to be able to um, get this approved and be able to, um, you know, have it be a, a good addition to the neighborhood. Thank you, Josh. Um, Jeff, do you have any questions? No questions. Lee, do you have any questions? No, I don't have any. Sam? Did the uh, neighborhood committee have anything to say? They they supported the actually no they didn't have any comment on this project uh, at the May twenty eighth meeting so no new comment was was brought for this now. And that's kind of complicated because this is the uh, the original historic district and that committee is for Greater Prospect Hill. So there really is no committee that covers this. There is not. Great. Thank you, Sam. Susan? No, I don't have any questions. Um, is Duncan, is anybody else with us? Duncan, Ernesto, Derek, Jenny? Okay. Let's move on to comments. Jeff? Um, I, I like the changes and I'm going to support this. Great. Lee? I like them. I like the uh, style of the wrought iron fence, and I will support this. Great. Thank you. Uh, Sam? I very much appreciate uh, that the uh, petitioner has changed up their fencing material. I think that there's a lot of really ugly modern iron fencing out there, and I think the stuff that you found is fantastic. Um, I still think the... Uh, uh, would you go back to the site plan for a sec, Connor? Uh, the, what's the cross street that's um, Prospect or Rogers? Not Prospect, the other one. Is that Rogers? Rogers. Uh, Rogers. I still have issues with, the, because it's a corner lot, you basically have two front yards. And I get what you're trying to do, um, but I still have issues, especially with the Rogers side. Um, I mean, I went and did a little uh, walk around the place and uh, now I can kind of see if you're running the, the fence along Prospect where you're running it as long as it, you know, there's a little, if, could you Google map for a sec there, Connor, along Prospect? Yeah. Uh, yeah, right there, perfect. So if you're pulling the fence out, like right where the edge of the brick walk stops, 
is it's a little difficult to tell where you're pulling it out from the um, from the site plan. But uh, so you've you've got this little uh, wah! You did. Can you go back to where you were when you get a sec. So and yeah, Mr. De, Mr. De Solar, I, I could comment on that. I know it's hard to see from the um, design, but I think if you can look at that brick patio, the idea yep. would be just to take it, take one gate, just enough as a gate section across that brick patio um, mm -hmm. to allow the entrance off the sidewalk and then um, not take it any further down. Um, so, does, only so, so does the front face of the fence run across uh, it comes out from that little corner of the bay that, uh, right before you hit that little blue container. It, it would be running um, parallel along Prospect and yes. then it would come and make a 90 degree turn to the north as soon as you cross the brick. Um, you, you'd need to come, excuse me, you need to come just a little bit farther to be able to um, still include the door. So if you can see where those three um, purple pots are, I guess yep. that's actually a pretty good little spot. If you, if just to the edge of that, it looks like that would be about far enough to come over to make sure that the um, steps there are enclosed and you don't have to have a lot of, you know, turns to make it to there. So just be a simple 90 degree turn to tie it right into the house, probably about a couple feet to the north of that door. Right, so, so I guess what I'm, what I would suggest or what I'm trying to get at is, the, behind the purple pots, there's a blue container, and right. there's the corner of the house. It looks like there's your gated and steps down right to the right of that. So if you yes. come out going north south at from the corner right there before you hit that blue thing, out to the front of the uh, little brick walk, and so the gate happens basically right where the walk tees into, the brick tees into uh, the other brick patio, and then goes straight across to the garage. Is that what happens, or is, uh, is something different happening? I, I guess I'm having a little trouble following that. If you could describe it one more time, I'm sorry. Okay, Connor, put your cursor. Uh, yeah, so right there at that corner, it starts at that corner. That, yeah, and it would come. It would come south from there to the wall. It, it comes all the way to that limestone wall. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, okay. And then it makes a ninety-degree turn east and runs along that south wall to um, the corner by the garage. So if it comes all the way to that south wall, you're bridging those steps with the gate and the fence. It looks like. Yes, that, that would be, um, well, it, I guess is what I would do is I wouldn't, I would have it even with the grade line there where the bricks are. So it would be at the top of those steps. So maybe a couple feet back, so you don't have to, so by the time you get to the top of the step, the gate is there. So it's not hovering over that second step down. So it's even with um, where the bricks are, not the limestone step, if that makes sense. I understand, thank you. We're on questions, right? Comments. No, we're on comments. I, okay. So my, my comments here are, um, because you have a corner lot, you basically got two front yards. And the guidelines, as I read them, uh, frown on front yard fences, which is why they uh, have that midpoint issue. So, I mean, my my leaning would be to have it halfway down the back so you didn't even basically see that fence and then you said so that you don't you know the 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 wrought iron piece would go run north south parallel to we look at, we're on rogers now right yeah so the north is that's rogers yeah so we're we're on rogers right now so it, it'd be back you know back sort of midpoint uh, on the backyard so you wouldn't even see it. So you wouldn't have any uh, wrought iron at the back. It would just basically be a, a piece of wrought iron fence that ran north-south along the midpoint of the back facade to a eight foot high fence. And then that goes and corners back to the garage. And then I, my my, my other issue is it feels like the fence is coming 
too far forward on prospect. So I, I would push it back. I mean, I understand why they're trying to do what they're trying to do. They want to get access to their yard um, fenced in from both sides. Um, but I really think that having that wrought iron fence forward, especially on the, uh, the Rogers Street side, is problematic. Here, you know, I'm willing to suck it up a bit, but I put it back at the face of the, where the brick tees into the brick. So about three, four feet out from the face of the limestone steps at the porch, right in there. Yep, right in there. So, so have, where that brick is, um, it would come off of the house by the blue thing, maybe make a turn even with where the brick patio is and yep. then go to the garage and you'd have a, about, what is that, four or five feet would be my guess of, of um, buffer between the wall and the fence. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that's, I, that's, that's, I'm, I'm, that's a, that's a great compromise and I can put some vegetation in there between that um, or just leave it as grass, kind of enough for a mower length if you think about it as that too. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. That, 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 I'm happy to make that change. Thank you. Thank you. Other than that, I got no, I got no issues. Okay. Susan? I really appreciate all the changes that you've made, um, even starting with this. So, uh, yeah, I'll support this. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I have got, I don't have any comments. Uh, I do like the changes, and uh, I think uh, we need to get a motion. I'm going to move that we approve COA 2020 um, as it stands. This is Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Second, it's Lee. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sam DeSolar? No. Susan Dyer? Yes. Jeff Golden? Yes. Lee Sandweiss? Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Motion carries 5 1. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, I'd like to thank you to the commission. Um, really look forward to uh, working with you guys over the years on this property and uh, keeping it up and um, really going to enjoy the place. So thank you so much for the time and I appreciate the approval and all the help, Josh. Connor, especially. Thank you. Josh. Nice fence, uh, by the way. Thanks. Thank, thank hey, you. Josh. Yes. There's a place in Minneapolis called Doc Keys. They specialize in architectural salvage and they may have some of the iron pieces you may want. Is that Doc Keys, like Dr. Yeah. Keys? Like D-O-C-K-E-Y-S. And Louisville okay. Architectural Salvage might be worth looking at too. Yeah. Louisville Architectural Salvage. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to COA, or actually it's demolition uh, de delay. Demo delay 20-13, 126 East. Ridgeview Drive. Petitioner is uh, Carol Damon. Uh, Carol, are you with us? I'm here. Oh, thank you, Carol. Okay, um, so this is a, a contributing structure. It was actually uh, added as a contributing building in the BRI 2018 survey update. Uh, it was not on the 2015 shard, it was, so it was added in the most recent survey update. Uh, the request is for a full demolition. Um, this is in the Sunny Slopes neighborhood, uh, so it's kind of off of South Walnut Ridge and East Ridgeview. Mm -hmm. um, I drove around the neighborhood the other day and I noticed uh, a very similar kind of architectural pattern going on with maybe one or two different variations of the same basic uh, style. Um, and so my first thought was maybe knowing that the neighborhood was developed in the 1950s, perhaps, you know, some of these are the, the prefab uh, houses, you know, maybe Gunnison Magic Homes or, or, you know, some of the other ones that were doing it, National Homes and so forth. So I actually contacted uh, an expert, Randy Shipp, and asked him to look at uh, the neighborhood. And he told me that he didn't believe these were prefab homes. Um, some of the smaller units might be demountables, uh, which are essentially like pre-constructed in the factory and then just offloaded on the truck on site, uh, pre-finished. Um, or they, he said they just could be, you know, regular old working man's 
economy size little uh, you know ranch houses. So uh, he didn't think they were prefab, but you know I, I would ask you know the the commission maybe to to spend some time and energy looking in this neighborhood. Um, it, it, it's it's kind of unique. These houses are are you know. Uh, certainly from a certain period of time and are recognizable as such. Um, while I don't uh, think that we have grounds to recommend designation at this stage, uh, I do think this neighborhood could be an area of future study. Um, so these are some pictures uh, given to me by the petitioner, Carol. Um, looks like they, uh, I think they had a flood or something in Earth. Uh, push through the, the the foundation walls, and you can see how it's kind of buckling inwards there from the pressure from the earth. So it's certainly structurally in very poor shape. Uh, so staff would recommend uh, release of demolition delay uh, nineteen, sorry, twenty thirteen. Thank you, Carol. Do you have any additional information? So um, I have maybe a lot of information. These actually are prefab homes. My parents bought this house and they moved in October, 1956. They were the second people to move into this neighborhood. Um, I can probably tell you everybody that's lived in these houses. So um, this, is, this has been my home. And the reason I'm asking for the permit is because when we had the flood in February, um, it took out the foundation. There's not a wall that's really structurally safe at this time. Um, and I'm going just to build a house back there. Um, and it will probably be where I retire. I have ties to this neighborhood. I, like I said, this is house. My parents were the original owners of this house. So Carol, do you know who, what company your parents bought the house from if it's a prefab? You know, we found those papers and I, I didn't even think to look at it. I know it is not a national home, but it is a prefab home. Um, all the houses in the neighborhood are the same. There is one that's a tri-level and one or two that have been added onto. But they're um, either set long ways, lengthwise or long ways on the neighborhood, on the lots, but they are the same. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carol. Um, Jeff, do you have any questions? I do not have any questions. All right. Lee, do you have any questions? Nope. Sam? Uh, as the petitioner explorator, would you be at all interested in exploring just jacking the house up and replacing the foundation with something that's, you know, got a French drain or something? Or is it uh, prohibitively expensive and not worth it? Uh, it I have. I've talked to him. Um, just to do one and a half walls or a quarter wall was going to be over $30,000 just to do that. So it was for this neighborhood and the value of the houses in there, it is prohibitive, cost prohibitive. Thank you. Uh, Susan? No, I don't have any questions. Uh, Duncan, are you with us? Okay. All right, uh, I don't have any questions of Carol either. Um, sorry, I wasn't, I was muted. Oh, I'm sorry, Duncan. That's okay, I was, I was muted. I, my only question is, uh, really for Connor, in, the, in your statement in the agenda, you said something about unless some historic significance about the neighborhood surfaces, um, has, has, is there anything like that that has surfaced or any reason to think that this is a, a one-off, one-of-a-kind subdivision or? Yeah, so I, I was trying to, to see if perhaps, you know, maybe I, I was trying to get to the origins that the of, of the neighborhood itself. And I thought that it might be, uh, you know, kind of a prefab neighborhood, maybe homes built or by, you know, one one company. Um, I talked to a guy and he didn't seem to think that these were prefabs, although Carol, who said her parents uh, bought the, the home originally, said that it is prefab, prefab. So I need to look into it a little more. And, you know, it, it, it has merit beyond just a prefab home. That wouldn't be the only grounds for designating this neighborhood. Um, you know, there is a, a very similar architectural theme and going on. Um, most of the, the homes are relatively uh, un unaltered. And you could really tell that they were uh, of the same period and, 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 and type. Um, so I think that the neighborhood 
uh, is this really interesting little enclave of these small, affordable, um, you know, uh, mid-century houses. And I think that, you know, in the future, we should potentially explore and talk to homeowners. I already spoke with Angela, our neighborhood's program manager, and she said that the neighborhood doesn't have a neighborhood association that's active. Um, so, you know, that would be the first person that I was going to reach out to about potential designation, um, but uh, seemed to be a dead end there at the moment. But to answer your question, I would say yes, Duncan. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, any comments, Jeff? I'm going to support the release. I don't think this merits uh, an a individual designation. Lee? I agree with Jeff. Sam? Agree. Susan? I agree. Okay, I agree as well. So, um, in the motion, or just go into the motion. So, <clears throat> today, regarding the property located at um, 126 East Ridge, Ridgeview Drive, the Historic Preservation Commission declares that it got notice of proposed demolition. And after today's discussion, sees no need to review the plans any further and waives the rest of the demolition delay waiting period. The HPC may later recommend the property for historic designation to the county council. Second. That was Jeff. All right, All right. thank you. Sam DeSoller? Yes. Susan Dyer? Yes. Jeff Golden? Yes. Lee Sandweiss? Yes. John Saunders? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so let's move on to new business. And our uh, first um, uh, under new business is Annex Project. No, Roseville. Oh, I'm sorry, Roseville Cemetery. Uh, so Barbara Dunbar, who manages the Rose Hill Cemetery, contacted me uh, about a week and a half ago and told me that they had plans to remove this fountain um, and then kind of just create the, uh, a little plaza area here. Uh, so as you can see, there is no fountain here anymore. The uh, fountain that was built, I believe, in the early 1900s uh, has been moved to the Third Street Park. Um, so all we're left with here is, is a base a pedestal of a fountain, and you can see that it, it water, because of the convex shape, just collects here and breeds mosquitoes, and there's a, a lot of significant damage along the base of it. These are photographs that I actually took before Barbara contacted me, and I thought to myself, wow, this, this really needs some attention, uh, because you can see here, uh, you know, the, the limestone's falling off. So uh, Barb said that the city is planning on um, demolishing the remnants, which you're seeing here today, and then creating kind of a plaza area where they can you know, gather and have events and such. Um, so uh, the Historic Preservation Commission doesn't uh, technically have purview over Rose Hill Cemetery and this particular uh, feature, uh, but Barbara wanted me to bring it up with the commission to let you guys know that this was happening and and if you guys had any comments or feedback about it. Okay. Jeff? I have a question. Is, uh, so the Rose Hill Cemetery is not a historic district? No. Okay. Um, so I, I don't really have any questions. I guess my comment is um, I wish they would have never moved the fountain. Um, it was a big loss there. So I, I'm not sure how I feel about this. Um, I used to walk that cemetery all the time and that the courtyard area is already super cool. Um, so I'm conflicted. Okay. Does anybody have any suggested ideas for what they could do with this if they kept it? Well, maybe that space where the fountain was could be some kind of special spot you know some kind of public art some kind of garden some kind of you know something reverent and also 
save the limestone. You know, maybe the limestone could be incorporated in whatever takes the place of this. It is a shame though, but I'm glad we're having an opportunity to look at it and, and think about it. I guess the obvious thing is to put a fountain in there, fix the thing and put and put some kind of water fountain in. I mean, it wouldn't have to be a sculpture, it could just be a motor, a jet. Mm. I mean, it's still it's still a gathering place. It, it still it seems like it still would qualify as a gathering place. Um, take care. Absolutely. Of, we take mm -hmm. care of the mosquito problem. It's definitely a it has historic meaning. You know, it, I, it's probably become a maintenance item that nobody wants to pay for. But it doesn't look. I we only have a couple of shots of it, but it doesn't look irreparable. It looks like it could be fixed. Yeah. And if they don't have electrical, they could run solar out there and just power the pump that way. Well, there was a fountain there before, so I'm imagining yeah. that there's infrastructure. Yeah. Well, Duncan uh, mentioned, and he's right, that, you know, as a gathering space, and I think the idea that Parks is thinking about is with the removal of this fountain, it can function as a gathering space even more so because there would be more, more room there to gather, more of an open area. I guess yeah, I agree with Duncan that making this a fountain again would be really cool. Yeah. And people like to gather where, where the action is. I mean, you think about Showalter Fountain, would people really gather there if it was just like a flat stone? Well, maybe, but I think it'd be cool just in terms of the history of the cemetery and what was, I mean, if it's doable and, and it's affordable, I think it should be done. Could be a focal point. What I'm hearing is that we should recommend that they keep the fountain and restore it to its function again. To keep the base and keep the and, base and, and, and make it functional. functional. Yeah. Is that what we want to recommend? Right, and I agree with Duncan. It doesn't have to be anything special, just moving water. Okay. All right, I will uh, take those recommendations uh, and convey that information to Barbara. Thank you, Connor. Mm -hmm. All right. So are we doing Johnson Creamery or are we going to do the Johnson Creamery? All right. We're going to move on to Johnson Creamery. There's a extensive report on the condition of the chimney in our packet. Yeah, I just want to bring it up to the, the commission. I, I spoke with the, the property owners uh, in the Zoom call about three weeks ago. Um, and, uh, you know, they had this structural report done. Um, if you read the conclusion and the repair actions, there are eight items there. And the one that I thought was really concerning was item number one, which is uh, demolishing the uppermost 15 feet of the chimney. Um, so uh, I think that's that's what they're seriously considering at this stage. They want to lock the top of this chimney off. Um, they introduced the idea of re building that with brick or with some other, uh, you know, material. Um, however, they were asking me uh, what kind of uh, regulations or approvals and permits do they need to do this. Um, and uh, essentially from the Historic Preservation Commission, um, it would be a demolition delay review of sorts uh, because it's not in a local historic district. Uh, it wouldn't be a certificate of appropriateness um, but since the Johnson Creamery is on the historic sites and structures list, uh, demolishing part of that chimney would need a demolition delay review. So I've talked to the owners. I told them that was the case. I told them I would show you guys the report um, and uh, I would help them through that process when they decided or when they made a decision on the fate of the chimney. So I just wanted you to have the report um, with you to read and, and come to your own conclusions about it and, and, and be prepared to speak on it when it comes up in the future. Connor, Why is this think, property not individually designated? It's in the West Side Historic District. The West Side National Register District, sure. Yeah, yeah National Register District. Yeah, so yeah, also, yeah, but that doesn't give us any control. No, it's also singly it's also singly listed in the National Register, so it, it would mandate a 106 review, and we would be consulting parties to that. It wouldn't mandate a 106 review unless the 
owners are using federal money. Right. But right. they're not. And you don't know if you don't know if they are not or that you know that they're not. No, they told me they weren't. <clears throat> <clears throat> I would be opposed to it. Well, yeah, if this came up as demolition delay, I would definitely recommend for uh, individual designation locally. Absolutely. And maybe it's something we should, is this something we could consider now as moving to designate it? Good. I mean, that's an option when you start moving forward to designate it as a story. The other piece of the report that I want to call attention to is the they said that the uh, all of the uh, aerials up there were causing additional wind drag yeah. so yeah that ain't helping matters I guess is what I'm saying we should recommend that they be taken down they also they also didn't say anything about whether they were going to put them back up after they took that 15 feet off exactly yeah. Just, I can give you a little history on this because I redeveloped that building um, we put we put we had an inspection done on the on the smokestack. This is actually the second smokestack. There was a previous one that was torn down. This one was built when the boiler capacity was increased as the factory grew, and it was taller than it is now. It's there's several several feet have been taken off. I don't remember exactly how much, but quite a bit. Um, we didn't take it off. It had already been done. Um, at the time, it didn't have a cap on it. And we hired a steeplejack company out of Chicago and they came down and put five or six bands on it and tuck pointed the entire exterior and a significant amount of the interior. And that was in about 96, 95 maybe. Um, and then, so I read that report with interest because it, it has continued to deteriorate. And I think that the report is pretty accurate in terms of its analysis of what, what the issues are. I mean, they, they've been the issues all along. When the, when the Creamery property got sold um, to Pinnacle, I don't know if they still own it or not, but they did, they did another rehab on it by, and put on a, a lot of those additional bands. And then some, somewhat later, a few more bands were put on. Um, and it was under Pinnacle's ownership that they petitioned to put a the antenna and so on on there. And that did require a 106 review because of the federal agencies involved in approval of cell towers. So it is technically a cell tower. Um, and I don't know whether that, what that federal jurisdiction, there is still federal jurisdiction because those cell towers are all licensed. Which, which requires 106. So as long as it's under that licensure, I think it requires 106. Now, um, um, that said, these things do die. <laughs> Witness the first one. Um, and they do, they really take a lot of beating in the terms of the weather. And um, I actually thought it was pretty noble of them to be trying to save it, um, considering you know, I know the report says this many feet is good and this many feet is good, but it also there are a lot of places where it's, there's some significant spalling, which will require, you know, pretty costly repair. Um, one of the suggestions what, with that removal of the top 15 feet, the way I read this was that the reason they wanted to do that was because that's where the, the bowing is taking place. That's where the stresses are being expressed. And that creates a physical danger, to be honest. I mean, if that thing fell, you know, spalling fate brick face is one thing, but uh, 15 feet of that tower or something else. And there, there is a remedy that's common, which is to put on a steel, a steel column. You'll see them all over the country. They take the tops off and put those on. He actually, the, the, the report writer actually suggested that as one of the remedies or rebuilding it in a somewhat different material, which I think is also, I would hate to lose the height of it, but um, I think those are both, you know, pretty reasonable remedies. I spent a lot of time investigating these kinds of structures 
for the developer. And I spent a lot of time with the, the guys who were fixing it. I think we spent about 35 or $40,000 on it at that time. Um, and it's never been in excellent condition. And, and they finally put a cap on it to try to keep the moisture out of it, which apparently has worked. Um, but it's always going to need regular maintenance, whoever owns it. Now it's a landmark, of course, and so nobody wants to lose it. I, I fought the cell tower, but I lost. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know, but I, I thought the report was just, I'm just, as a preservationist, just saying I thought the report was pretty accurate and I'm pretty familiar with the condition of it. I was a little bit alarmed that it's deteriorated as much as it has. Uh, since we did our repairs. Thank you, Duncan. But I, I still think it's very likely that it would require a 106 review because of the federal licensing. We'll look into it. Yeah, I mean, if it requires a section 106 yeah. review, that's something that's completed by a different party. And, and they would I know, but, I know but our preservation commission would be consulting party. Absolutely. So we would we would we would be able to write an opinion about how what we wanted to see happen that would be more bi not binding but it would have more influence under 106. So if we suggested as as Sam said for instance that that the the cell tower function be removed because it's damaging the structure or potentially damaging the structure or has already damaged the structure, that seems like that would have some clout, you know. So, I mean, 106 is a, is a moving target. We all know that. It's not necessarily, you know, you can say all you want and, and they won't do anything sometimes. But it's still, we do have standing, as, that's my point, as opposed to not having standing over it just being on the National Register. Okay. Right, but if you, I mean, if you're really interested in, in, in saving it, then, then it needs to be designated at the local level because that's really where the, where the, the teeth are um, for any kind of important preservation. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but I'm kind of getting on the back end that trying to save all of it might be a difficult problem. I mean, if we designate it, it becomes historic, and then trying to save all that chimney can be a difficult endeavor for somebody at that point. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that I'm reading that right, Duncan? Yeah, but I mean that, you know, that's true of all historic structures. I mean, they all age and they all require maintenance. And, and you know, this is, you know, I, <laughs> I wouldn't want to own it. I'll tell you that. But, uh, you know, the, the last two owners anyway have been pretty good stewards of it. And these people have done a pretty reasonable job getting, a, I think, an authoritative report. It sounds like they want to save it. Um, uh, and, you know, we, Maybe it should have been better maintained, and maybe it would have been better maintained had it been a local historic site, you know. But that's the only way to give us any jurisdiction. You know, the owner may may not want to do it, but if we want to have protection, a role in protecting it, that's our only our only real way to do it. So it's no different from maintaining the showers building or any any other historic site. I mean, and I want to add that, that after speaking to the owners, you know, they're, they read the report too, and they're well aware that that lean was caused by the wind shear on that telecommunications equipment. So, um, you know, they know that, that removing that equipment um, and doing some repairs there could essentially save that from, from further deterioration and damage. And so um, I think that will be part of the conversation is what to do with that, with that equipment. Yeah, that's what I'm Good. Okay, Sam, any comments? No, I, I would second what Duncan's talking about. I think, you know, the, the, the other piece of this is this is a less useful piece of property. Um, the only real use for it is to put these antennas on there. So if they have to maintain it and they're not getting anything back from it, they're gonna be in some ways less inclined to do anything about it, so. I'm happy that they've done everything they've done so far. Um, and I think it's a lovely piece of uh, the Bloomington skyline. So great if they could save it, but uh, if it comes down to it and it starts deteriorating to such a point that it becomes a, a public hazard. Um, yeah, you know, we, we protect safety 
I'm sorry, we protected it, you know, because we were doing a federal tax credit on the rehabilitation and we had to save it. <laughs> it wasn't even, it wasn't any choice. And we wanted to, but it was, you know, they, the park service wasn't going to let us tear it down. It's too, too significant a part of the structure. Would their position have changed at this point? Probably not. I mean, once it becomes a public safety issue, they they kind of back away because local authorities handle those issues. But if you went to do another tax credit job on this building, they would want it to be saved. You know, they would because they don't they don't get into the money argument. They're giving you money. <laughs> you know, they're saving you taxes. So. Um, if you were to develop, I mean, the developer, the original developer on this project, I can't remember exactly, but it was probably close to $600,000 federal tax credit. That's a, that's a piece. So it was worth 35,000 to fix the, the stack. But I, the current owner may not have an incentive like that. You know. Okay, and uh, Jeff? Well, I, again, I, I agree with what both Duncan and Sam say. You know, the safety issue is definitely a concern, but the loss of this uh, landmark, um, I think, would be significant. So if there is some way to, um, I think the height is important. And if it has to be rebuilt in a different way, Duncan suggested um, a couple things, and that may be a compromise. Thank you, Jeff. Lee? Um, I, I think this building is so important, that structure is so important, the height's important, um, and I think it should be locally designated to give it as much protection as we possibly can. Yeah. I think we'd get a lot of, we'd have support for that. Everybody loves this building. I agree, I think we're all in agreement on this. Susan? Yeah, I'd agree with that too. Okay. All right, um, so right now, do we want to move, we want Connor to do the investigation or do we just want to wait until they, okay. So we'll, we'll wait until they come back to us and, and make a decision from that. Okay, now we want to move to the annex project or grant. And I think we have uh, Craig Clyde with us. Um, they will uh, talk to us about the project. Sure. You're free uh, to screen share, Craig, if you need to. Okay. Hope everybody can see. Um, so I'm Craig Pride. I'm the architect for uh, the project with KTGY Group um, out of Chicago. And we're the architect for a number of projects for Annex around the country. Um, Joy Skidmore may be on the call, but I know she has to leave for another meeting. And then, um, uh, Greg is also going to be speaking a little bit tonight, possibly. So we've got a short slide presentation on the proposed project that we have designed at uh, 3rd and Grant Street in Bloomington. So uh, I'll walk you through it here. Um, first of all, can everybody see the screen? I'm hoping, Connor, you're good on that end. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the proposed site is, again, at the corner of 3rd and Grant, and the sites are both on the east and west side of Grant Street, adjacent to 3rd. Um, the project is coming to, um, uh, will be coming to the Plan Commission and is being developed as a workforce housing development. Um, we are working under the uh, confines and regulations of the new, um, UDO that was recently passed. Um, and a uh, little bit about the developer, um, if you're not aware about them, the Annex Group is out of Indianapolis. Um, they're a developer of multifamily housing. Um, they're also a general contractor and self-perform in, uh, in that role. And then they own and operate their facilities. So they're um, kind of a long-term um, builder, not a merchant builder that would build, sell, and move on. Um, they build, own, and operate, and maintain their facilities. 
Um, Annex has about 975 million in commercial project development experience. Um, they develop in affordable housing, workforce housing, as well as uh, multi-use uh, or multi-purpose, multi-family projects. They were also the developer of Union at Crescent, which I believe was an, a, another affordable um, development in Bloomington recently. Yeah, Craig, I'm actually gonna jump in here. This is- There you go. With Annex, hi. Um, sorry, I don't have my video going because my internet connection is not great. Um, You're on the historic district um, site. Yeah, I don't want to. Um, I don't want to slow anything down for sure. But I do want to just jump back in a, a little bit about us. I think when we came through the first time, I'm not sure if any of you folks were were on the board about three years ago on our previous project when we brought it through. Um, but we were at that time in student living, and we focused mainly on student housing projects. And we have since rebranded to the Annex Group. So it, with that rebranding, the reasoning for that is because our focus has shifted to low-income housing tax credit projects and workforce housing. So it sort of worked out well to develop a workforce housing project on this site where originally we had planned for, for student housing. Um, Craig, I don't know if you want to take back over. Yeah, if, if you want. Sure. Um, we've got on the screen right now um, the, the two parcels highlighted in the aerial view and showing our proximity to the historic district. Um, the, the previous project, as we originally brought it through, was planning on renovating the contributory structure on the very north end of uh, property owned by Annex. Um, that is not included in the current proposal and the sites that we are bringing forward for development are what's highlighted in the red boxes. Um, so we're adjacent to the red, uh, sorry, the restaurant row district. Um, we're in the new um, MD-UV zoning district um, as, as outlined in the new UDO. And we also are responding to the downtown core overlay um, development requirements. So uh, again, a little bit of history. Uh, I think it was back in 2017, uh, we came forward and approached uh, both the plan commission and the historic preservation commission with a development on both sides of the street. Uh, that was a four story building that was primarily student housing at that time. Um, we were asking for a number of deviations or variations in that process from the zoning code at the time for height variations and density. Um, we are not doing that at present. Um, however, we took the feedback that was given to us as the outcome of the both meetings with the Historic Preservation Commission and the Plan Commission. Um, and then two years later have tried to uh, respond appropriately in, in meeting our objective in the new development. Uh, um, so the proposed project uh, includes both affordable housing and workforce housing units. Um, it qualifies for the tier two incentives that are outlined in the UDO. Um, we intend to meet uh, all of the UDO requirements, including building height requirements with the incentives. Um, we are not proposing uh, re or requesting any waivers as part of the um, approval process. Um, we are not including the uh, historic home or the historic site in the development area um, in, in this go round. Um, and all of the, the primary materials for this project are brick veneer and cementitious siding or um, panel and primarily brick on the lower three levels. Um, a little bit of overview, between the two development parcels, we have a total of 102 units, uh, 53 units proposed on the east site, uh, 49 units proposed on the west. Um, there will be a total of about 7,200 square feet of retail proposed between the two project or two buildings. Um, we are providing 45 uh, on-site parking spaces and a total of about 85 or 86,000 square feet between the two buildings um, being developed over what is uh, 0.7 acres. 
Um, our proposed mix uh, through the project is a combination of studio, one bedroom and two bedroom units. Um, and I believe this is talking about the rent levels. So we have of studios, uh, we're proposing um, four units at the 80% AMI level and four units at the 120 level. Um, one bedrooms, we have three units in each of those categories and we provide two, uh, one two bedroom in each of those cate categories out of the total 102 units. Um, in talking about the site plan, again, the site is both east and west of Grant Street. So the eastern portion or the eastern building um, really takes up the entire area bound by Third Street on the south, Grant on the west, uh, an unimproved alley on the north, and an improved alley on the east. Um, both buildings have enclosed parking that are, is on the ground floor. Um, the east building, we are using the current curb cut off the north alley to access our garage, which will be essentially built into the hill. Um, we have severe sloping sites on both parcels of property. Um, the site grade elevation is approximately about a nine foot drop on both sites from the southeast corner to the northwest corner. So it's almost an entire story on the east building. It's about uh, two thirds of a story on the, on the western block. The pink is highlighting our space that is proposed as uh, retail use. Um, in the UDO, at least 50% of the ground floor area that is not parking uh, needs to be dedicated to a commercial use. Um, in both cases, we far exceed um, that regulation um, and are probably closer to 60 to 80% of the um, non-parking space of the building is devoted to retail. Um, the West building uh, is really an, it's an L-shaped configured site. So we look at it, both, both parcels have two street frontages. Um, the East building has a full kind of full development property um, frontage to Grant Street as well as Third Street. Um, the Third Street elevation rises quite a bit. So the ability to interact or access that ground floor level um, beyond mid block uh, is challenging because you're almost at the second floor level when you get to the alley at the Southeast corner. Um, the West building, again, is retail on the corner of Third and Grant. Um, the amount of parcel that faces Grant Street is only about 40% of the, uh, what I would say that, that mid block length. Um, so we have a very small segment of the building that fronts Grant Street on the Western block, and then uh, full frontage on Third Street. Um, so you can see again, the retail is on the corner. Both buildings have a residential access point. The east building is uh, set back off of Grant Street on the north side of the retail. The residential entrance on the west building is mid block on Third Street. Um, and that's so that we can devote as much contiguous retail space as possible and to attract a better retail tenant. Um, again, we provide parking for the west building that is also accessible off of the alley to the north. The alley to the north is a one-way drive going westbound. So you will enter the project going west down the alley, in and out of the garage, and then continue west um, back out to uh, downtown. The uh, design inspiration for the project, uh, we, we looked at um, two sets of data, you might say. Um, we asked for some recently approved projects in Bloomington, which are represented on the left in the dark gray area. And then we also kind of took a tour of buildings that were comparable in scale and use within the downtown Bloomington area and tried to use those as the inspiration of how we would um, say clad our building with materials and respond to the uh, really the, I won't say the challenges, but the prescriptive method of how we're to design the building under the new UDO requirements. So 
we have a series of uh, elevations and perspective to show you. Um, this is the, the third street elevation, Grant Street being in the middle. Um, both buildings are proposed at five stories. Um, the underlying zoning allows for three stories and the tier two incentive um, because the project is providing affordable and workforce housing um, allows by right a two story bonus of up to 24 feet and an overall height of 64 feet on both sites. Um, the again the base of the building as we are treating it the lower three floors the primary building material is a uh, brick veneer it is highlighted and accentuated with some uh, movements and articulation in the building that will be fiber cement and uh, the base of the building at grade is predominantly uh, storefront glazing um, we have followed the UDO requirements for modulization, or I'm sorry, modular articulation around the facades. Um, so that is a series of in and out movements um, from the exterior wall, as well as, as uh, a primary um, setback that occurs above the third floor or above 40 feet. Um, to set back the upper levels 15 feet from the story below. And so that's why you see the top two floors in this view are set back. Uh, that applies to both uh, the elevations that front Third Street as well as the segments of the building that front Grant Street. Uh, we have a couple of uh, kind of street level perspectives um, that coordinate the proposed landscape and streetscape um, for the design. Uh, again, we've, we've tried to articulate and really play up the interaction of Third and Grant as we're developing both sides of the street. Um, we want both, both buildings to kind of talk to one another. So there is a, um, a treatment of the corner of both of the buildings to try and present a gateway or an end, a, a, a sense of entry to the third and grant um, area that leads you to restaurant row. Um, this is the uh, West building. Um, we've modeled the uh, existing two-story structure that is uh, on the historic parcel to at the Northeast corner of the Western um, block of development. Um, there are two parcels of land. One is the one with the two-story um, contributing structure. And then there is a vacant parcel that currently is a um, just a gravel surface lot. Um, again, those parcels are not in the development area, but we're providing the view um, to just give you some perspective of uh, how the rest of the building is uh, responding to this particular area. Um, this would be a view uh, looking east down Third Street. Um, again, you can you can tell the kind of significant impact that the uh, the new UDO requirements for modulization, articulation, and step backs um, is is having on the building, which not only it, it does add interest. Um, again, we're also trying to make the the topper or the upper levels of the floor uh, a little bit lighter in terms of material reality and um, uh, weightiness. Uh, again, the lower three, four, three floors are emphasizing um, a predominance of brick veneer, um, along with the use of double hung windows as the primary window uh, for light and ventilation of the units, and then further activating the, the resident experience to the local neighborhood with uh, balconies and uh, sliding glass doors. So that's, uh, that's a general overview of the project and uh, would love to take any feedback or questions uh, that you might have on the development. And um, I, I can certainly go back to any particular uh, slide um, as you wish. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff, questions? Um, not yet. I'm gonna listen to what happens in the next few minutes. Okay, uh, Lee, do you have any questions? No. Sam? 
does uh, your group own the vacant lot between the historic property and, and the little L building on the west side, or is that owned by some other uh, entity? Uh, let me go back here. Um... Okay, so which uh, which which area are you talking about? The west lot, about mid block on the east side. That guy. This one right here. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I do believe they own these two parcels as well. Okay, yeah. and but they're they're deciding not to. Is there a rationale for not including that uh, parcel in the uh, development at this point? Um, I. You know, they had talked previously about um, trying to convert this into a different use, um, but had not come to any decision. But no, we're, I, I don't have any insight as to why not. We've just been, you know, we've been given the land that we've, we've got to work with. And so that's what we're working with. All right. I hear you. I'm an architect, so I feel your pain. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, Susan? No, I don't have any questions right now. Duncan? Duncan still with us? Okay. Um, sorry, I was muted again. Um, I understand that some of it is affordable housing um, and workforce development, but what the rest is, is market rate? Yes. yes, I believe that's correct. And do you have a, can you estimate the percentage of market rate? Um, I think it was 85, 15, 15, mar, uh, 15 affordable, 85% market rate, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't have any questions at this point. Connor, you got anything? Okay. So let's move on to comments. Jeff? Well, one of my comments is around the city's requirement for modulation. I really don't like that requirement. Um, I mean, this looks like every other building that's being built in Bloomington. Um, they're following the rules, uh, you know, and they're respecting the historic district. So um, I guess that's where I'm at. You know, I don't see a problem with this. Thank you, Jeff. Lee? Uh, I, I agree with Jeff. Thank you. Sam? Um, I, w I was on the commission, among, you know, other people were as well, but this is much more palatable than the last um, yeah. proposal on the same site. Uh, I appreciate the setbacks over three stories. Uh, I appreciate the ground floor retail. Um, I appreciate the street access. Uh, I'd also echo that, you know, sometimes you have rules to follow that aren't necessarily the best from a design standpoint. So I get that. Um, I, I am concerned about what happens on that lot, which is why I asked about it it feels like it's sort of putting off the problem till a later day because uh, at, at some point you're gonna have to address transitioning between a very large scale project, which this is, and the very small scale uh, of restaurant row and that historic property uh, at the Grant Street on the corner of uh, Grant Street on the, uh, Western, on the Western block. Okay, thank you, Sam. Uh, Duncan. Yeah, I mean, seeing it for the first time, it's a little, it's a little bit difficult to run much of a critique. But I, I, I agree with some of the stuff that that Sam said. I, I, I am also, you know, I, I get the, I get the UDO requirements. I, I don't always agree with them. Uh, I think that they're just going to produce another kind of architecture that all looks like the other kind of architecture. Um, I would like to see architecture that was more compatible with the historic district itself, but I recognize there's a massing 
dialogue there that's very difficult to conduct. Um, and I, I'm also worried, I, I, I'm afraid that not developing that northeast corner of the west lot is a co kind of a cop out to the design issues that came up in the first round a couple of years ago. And uh, a vacant lot is a pretty decent transition, but I don't know how long it's going to be vacant if, if the same development company owns it. Um, I don't want to avoid that conversation in this development. I think it needs to be addressed. If, if there are plans for it, they need to be expressed. Um, but yeah, it takes a little longer than one look to, to get close to something. But that's, those are all my comments for now. Uh, you know, my only concern is, as with the rest of my commissioners, about that vacant lot being there. Uh, it would be nice if the developer would make that, uh, make it so it wouldn't be used, uh, make it as green space. That would be nice. Uh, <coughs> um, do we need anything else? Because it's just a, a cursor review. Yeah, it's just a crazy review at this stage. I think the first iteration of their project uh, dipped into the restaurant row of historic district a little bit with that contributing property in the northeast corner of the west lot. Um, I think the developer responded to that by just not including it. So the Historic Preservation Commission really doesn't have purview uh, over what we're seeing today. I think what we're seeing today is strictly just a, a courtesy review and uh, we've fulfilled our function with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Greg. Thank you for everybody participating. So let's, um, we don't have any more new business. I don't see any old business on our uh, agenda. Do we have any commissioner comments? Hearing none, uh, are there any public comments? Hearing none. Uh, we don't have any announcements, so I move that we adjourn. Second. Thank you, everybody, for participating today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.